Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here today. And what I want to do today is, is as concisely and as, in, in as good a time as I can, introduce you to our City of Allen Mosquito Control Program. We really have had a mosquito control program for 10 to 12, maybe even more years. However, um, when I got to the city in 2000, uh, I found that we were using methods that really didn't uh, appeal to me as far as environmental uh, stewardship. And uh, through some um, work with our, our code and enforcement people, our health department, uh, we were able to turn that direction around from a, a chemical-oriented program to one that, that uses natural means. And so I want to introduce you to that. And, and uh, then if we have time, we'll, we'll answer some questions if you have any, uh, if that works for y'all. Um, so getting right into it, um, uh, I want to introduce you briefly just to the mosquito because it's very important to talk about the insect itself in, in the way it lives, the way it breeds and, and uh, uh, propagates. Um, it's very important in what I'm about to tell you to realize just the very basics of the mosquito life cycle. It goes through four stages like many in the insect uh, world. It goes through an egg, a larval, a pupa, and an adult stage uh, after which it dies. In the mosquito's case, uh, it has two critical stages, the egg and the larval stage. And when we're trying to introduce and manage a organic or a natural program, a non-chemical program, it's very critical to keep that larval stage and the time that the insect is developing in those stages and the number of days that we have to act on it, okay? Uh, the pupa stage, adult stage, certainly from our perspective, uh, we're treating something that's just cosmetic, uh, flying adult insects, basically. So we want to get to those, those developing insects within just a matter of days after they, they've laid eggs. Uh, as you know, for many years, we've all known that they trans numerous diseases. West Nile's a very uh, uh, commonly known condition today, West Nile virus. Uh, we've dealt with that ourselves. Uh, malaria has been around for ages and has been known to be transmitted by the mosquitoes. They are egg-laying, ovipositor-type insects, and they look for calm and stagnant and still waters where uh, their eggs can survive, and uh, that's their favorable background. I grew up in Oak Cliff when I was a little kid, and I remember the trucks driving up and down our streets during mosquito season, and these huge what at the time looked like military guns mounted on the back of these trucks driving down our street and, and fogging and shooting this stuff over our house and our front lawn. And I remember being very scared of that stuff. And, and it was for more than one reason now I realize. Uh, when mom called me in, uh, she had a good reason to do so. It was DTT or something. I don't know what they were putting out back then, but it wasn't good. Nevertheless, mosquitoes look for, for areas of quiet, isolated water. Uh, riprap, what we call rock riprap in, in public works projects. You notice the little pools and rivulets in there, that ideal situation for a mosquito uh, to lay eggs and breed. Uh, drain inlets, uh, I know you think of bird baths and more common things, but even the drain inlets in our, our sidewalks in our public areas, uh, they're still, they hold water sometimes if they don't drain properly. Again, a great breeding ground for mosquitoes. Let's take just a real quick look at the life cycle of the mosquito so to reinforce what I was talking about earlier. Um, you'll notice here the, uh, the cyclical stage of the, the mosquito starting over here on, the, on your right with an egg laid in the water and then it develops into a larva, a pupa, and then finally into an adult. In the larva stage, if you've looked at your bird bath, you've seen the uh, wrigglers as they're called, uh, these little tiny worm-like creatures wriggling. And then when they get into the pupa stage after that, they're, they're more called uh, something like tumblers and they look more like they're, they're rolling in the water. Still, they're very small, and just prior to developing into the, uh, the fully matured adult. Uh, here's a, his, his spraying safe. We have to ask ourselves that question when you, when you enter into any consideration of a, a organic program or a natural or more healthy way of, of controlling mosquitoes. And I do emphasize control. We don't feel like we can ever really or truly eradicate them. Control is the key word. Uh, this shot from 1958 uh, shows uh, the application of DDT um, for historical effect. Uh, is it safe? Well, let's consider the uh, typical strategy of a, of a spraying municipality. And again, I'm coming to you from a city perspective. Um, 
Spraying programs tend to be uh, reactive, I want to say, uh, especially now that we have to deal with West Nile virus. Uh, the media and other agencies can very easily communicate to us when West Nile strikes, where it strikes, how many people it strikes, and uh, the mosquito gets pulled into the story very quickly uh, as the vector. Uh, dying birds are also involved, but nevertheless, uh, we tend to react and respond to that information in a uh, after effect type uh, manner. And what I mean by that is uh, we tend to react by spraying or, or a lot of municipalities will. And what we're doing when we do that is we're really attacking the flying adults that are around us, the ones that we're slapping on our arms or our hands, the ones that are eating us up when we're out on the back porch. We're not really attacking them at their prior larval stage like we we've have found to be most effective. Uh, and safe. Um, when communities will spray, they will typically send out warnings to you. Don't, uh, don't linger outside while we're spraying, okay? It's, uh, there's a good reason for that. The materials they're putting out in those spraying programs, uh, although they can be quote-unquote um, semi-safe at best, uh, I would encourage you, if you're really curious, to, to look at any chemical you're curious about and pull up what's called an MSDS sheet, a material safety data sheet. Uh, you can look up online. And for any of the products, uh, Aqualure and, and other products that are used um, in, in city programs, and just see for yourself if that's something that sits with you well and you're comfortable with. Uh, I prefer to go a different direction. Um, Minimize exposure, they tell you that. Well, there's a good reason for that. Minimize your exposure, of course. Keep your windows closed, keep your pets indoors. My goodness, I have 10 cats at home, and can you imagine what we have to go through any time that the community I live in, which is not Allen, sprays for mosquitoes. Uh, so anyway, and then wash. Don't eat vegetables that have been uh, exposed to the spray. Cover your fish ponds and bird baths, of course. Uh, here's some photographic uh, further explanation of the mosquito. They, they lay their eggs in what's called rafts, which I, you see in this uh, lower uh, right hand or lower left hand picture. A very small collection of eggs that floats in the water. Then to the right of that, you see the larval stage. Those are the wrigglers, the rollers and tumblers, the pupa, and then the adults, of course. There's over 3,000 uh, genera, or, or I should say, uh, species of mosquitoes. Um, and there are some that are more prevalent with carrying disease than others. So it's a very, very, gets very technical uh, from a biological standpoint. Um, the results of spraying is it's only effective on those that are flying around out at the time of the spray, those that get exposed to the mist. Again, keep in mind the egg and larval stage uh, cycle and the time that's involved with those. At the eggs of laid, you've got, as you can see, essentially up to 16 days, two weeks to really effectively apply your organic program and, and have effect before they turn into uh, pupa and adults. We use a product called Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, BTI. It is a, uh, a bacteria, is what it is. Uh, for those of you who like history, it was discovered back in 1911 in uh, Thuringia, Germany, uh, when they were working on some moths that were infected. And uh, so since that time, over the last 100 years or so, they've been able to commercially produce it uh, through a process of fermentation. Um, so uh, just be aware if you ever go and, and are offered a, a pint of Thuringia uh, ale. <laughs> don't, don't drink it, okay? Uh, fermented uh, much in much like beer in tanks, quite frankly, uh, in a controlled environment. Uh, a little bit more about the product BTI. Um, today, you can find it uh, in numerous places that you uh, shop, your local nursery, your local hardware store, home improvement store. Um, you can buy it online. Um, I'm sure on, on Howard's website, uh, you can find numerous uh, vendors who, who sell these type of products. Um, they're quite common today. Um, they, they require specific storage conditions. You don't want to leave them out in the sunlight. They do break down quick. Uh, in fact, oh, gosh, I, I think I have some right here. Uh, we use these things called donuts, okay? They're, this is BTI donuts, and I'm not doing a promo for the manufacturer of this particular brand, but as you can see, it's compressed into an easy-to-throw, easy-to-apply form uh, that uh, you can put out in a body of water they say it's safe, you can put it in your bird bath, et cetera, et cetera. 
The BTI contains spores and crystals, and it, I just thought I'd just take a few minutes and tell you how it works. Uh, it selectively kills the larva stage. When you put these, uh, this material in the water where they're breeding, uh, these spores, if, uh, for lack of a better description, what they do is they invade the intestinal or gut cavity tract of the larva of the mosquito. Those crystals that are associated with the spores uh, basically spike the cavity wall, allowing uh, penetration, perforation. Eventually, the spores uh, or the bacteria invade the body cavity of the, the larva and very shortly thereafter cause death. Uh, death of the larva occurs anywhere from 15 minutes to up to an hour sometimes, depending on the conditions or the specific uh, genera or species. Uh, the spores uh, basically cause starving, paralysis, and, and blood poisoning or sepsemia or septic conditions in the larva. Uh, real pleasant to think about, but it's good to know it works and, and is effective that way. Um, like I said, it kills quickly. Um, the, uh, the city of Allen, for example, uh, when we budget each year for this, this type of program, uh, we, we get the funding from the drainage program through our community services uh, department. Our community development department, department Lee Battle and his staff, um, they, uh, they will distribute the material and uh, uh, they'll go to many of our lakes, ponds, creeks, uh, where we know stagnant water is breeding mosquitoes and such, and they will, they will distribute these BTI uh, uh, donuts, if you will, or granules. Uh, if we have time, I'm going to show you a, a very brief uh, public service announcement that we, we did a few years ago, just showing you more of our program and how it's implemented. Uh, we respond to complaints, of course. Uh, we had several cases of West Nile virus in Allen uh, last summer. I, I, the way we approach West Nile, though, is that when it's reported to us that a, a person in Allen has West Nile virus, uh, we take that information and we tend to uh, uh, approach it from the standpoint that, okay, did they get the West Nile from a mosquito in Allen or did they go to a lake one day, got bit at the lake, did they come back and now we have uh, somebody in our city who has it. I mean, obviously we have to take it very seriously from a medical standpoint. We don't rush, however, to assume that that particular incident of West Nile virus is cause enough to storm the neighborhood with spray trucks and such. We, we want to approach it a little more calmly, a little more, uh, I think, intelligently uh, with, with uh, due caution, but, but in a safe way as well. Um, several of the mosquito uh, genera that are, are more uh, the, uh, the bad guys, so to speak, are the Aedes and the Sorphora genera. Um, they tend to require more of the BTI to be effective, higher dosages than the Anopheles and the Culex genera. Um, we don't use mosquito fish, but I put this in the slideshow just to show you that there are other safe, non-chemical alternatives. Uh, the Gambusia fish is a, uh, a natural predator, as are goldfish. Um, for those of you who have ornamental ponds, in your backyard or, or other ornamental waters that are, are not also stocked with um, indigenous fish or, or others, game fish, etc. Gambusia are, are very uh, uh, hungry around mosquito larvae and this picture on the left shows you uh, the consumption process. Uh, and, uh, uh, however, we will not use these in our, our ponds and lakes around the city because they compete uh, with the fish that are already in the ponds that we have stocked, such as catfish or, or bass, etc., we don't want to disturb the ecosystem that's already in existence in those ponds with the mosquito fish. So, but I just want to let you know if you have an ornamental pond, they, that is an option that you have. You might want to look into it. We have a, a very brief uh, public service announcement uh, that was put together by our um, community um, development department, our, our health department, uh, several years ago, showing our program, introducing it to the public. Um, our city council back in 2002, I believe it was, was very receptive to uh, the direction we wanted to go at that time. At the time, we were contracted with another municipality uh, with a, a, a chemical program. And um, having met Howard a few years ago before that, prior to that, 
uh, I had been introduced, of course, to these, these uh, natural ways of managing things. And so we presented it to the council and they liked the approach and we've been doing it ever since. And uh, Kevin, if, if you can go ahead and start the video, I wanna show you this, it just lasts a few minutes. I think you'll find it interesting. Hi, I'm Joey Aletti, the Environmental Services Coordinator for the City of Allen. Today I'm going to talk about mosquito control and simple ways that you can prevent mosquitoes around your property. Typically when we think of mosquito breeding grounds, we think of swampy, nasty, marshy areas that have a lot of stagnant water. Poorly maintained properties that have high weeds and grass, trash and debris, old junk tires are going to have a lot of potential for mosquito breeding grounds. However, you'd be surprised to find out how many potential breeding grounds you have even around a well-maintained property. Mosquitoes have to have water in order to lay their eggs. The best way to prevent mosquitoes around your property is to simply to get rid of all the standing water. It doesn't take much water for mosquitoes to breed. They can actually breed in the amount of water that will fit into a thimble. Even as much water that's in this bird bath can be a perfect habitat for mosquitoes. That's why it's very important that you replace the water in a bird bath frequently. Even though planters like this that have sprinkler water in them can be a perfect habitat for mosquitoes. And you can control this by simply dumping out the water. It's also very important that you eliminate areas around your property that have poor drainage. Standing water such as this can be a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. So low-lying areas like this around your property should be regraded in order to encourage proper drainage. It's also very important not to overwater your property. Overused sprinklers can create puddles which are very attractive to adult mosquitoes. Even a cooler like this, which has leftover water from a weekend barbecue, can be an attractive habitat for mosquitoes. In the city of Allen, we use larvicide and briquettes and pellets to prevent the mosquitoes from actually hatching. We survey areas around the city of Allen and look for low-lying, stagnant water, areas that would be perfect breeding grounds for mosquitoes. We distribute the pellets and briquettes as needed in these areas. We use a motorized backpack sprayer to distribute the larvaciding pellets as needed. These pellets actually sink and provide longer lasting mosquito control measures. The larvaciding products that we use in the city of Allen are environmentally safe and don't pose a problem to the wildlife. So by simply surveying your property and taking these simple steps, you can save your family from being bombarded by these pesky mosquitoes. As I mentioned, it's brief, but I think you get the, the overall effect of, of how we approach our program. And um, that one was done several years ago. Uh, we, um, we have a, a new guy who's in environmental science, Lee Battle, who runs the program now. He's with our community development pr uh, department. And um, I, I, I am pleased to say, I'm uh, very happy to say that through the last mosquito season, we did not spray once. We, we kept with this same program and we continue to find it effective and, and safe. Although I do want to tell you, with any uh, natural product, there are still cautions that just the average user should take. I don't want to paint this picture that uh, you can go have this with coffee. <laughs> you just don't do that. It's uh, uh, always follow the instructions that come with any product. Uh, I've done several stupid things over my career from uh, when I, uh, just out of college spraying Roundup which is a no-no, of course, but uh, mixed with diesel fuel and without a mask in, in some, of our, some of the green belts where I worked. So if you can imagine, I, I think I'm probably very fortunate to be alive or healthy today. Um, I've also used early versions of uh, BT, uh, Thuricide, um, in a uh, what was called a trombone sprayer in my yard, uh, hand pump spray. And without a mask originally, and I remember breathing some of that stuff, and I thought, oh, I'm not doing this too good here. I, I got impatient. Take the time to read the instructions, even if it's safe. There, there are things, if you're, you can have allergies and such, that you, you don't want to contend with. Um, but anyways, uh, uh, also, we, uh, we, we have several opinions floating around on mosquito control and repellents, and I don't know if that's been covered today. Um, some people at the city, uh, adhere to products that contain DEET, which you may be familiar with. I personally don't. Um, I, I tend to uh, not like to use the stuff because of the uh, 
the product labels and other information that I've, I've been uh, fortunate to read about. Um, I encourage you to try to find other ways to apply uh, things to your own skin and body other than that uh, and be, go the least harmful approach you can. I'd like to take just a second as I finish up here to uh, thank a few people. Uh, Howard Garrett, of course, Doug Sheldon, uh, and the staff of the library here, uh, Jeff Timms, Tom Keener, uh, Kevin Vaught, and, and Norris Mantooth. Also some other people, Lee Battle, like I said, uh, Teresa Warren, Mark Kaufman with the uh, Public Information Office, and my boss, Tim Dentler. So anyway, thank you. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be glad to answer them either right now or whatever is more appropriate afterwards. Thank you very much.